Father, we cry out to you, and as we worship, we cry out, holy, holy, holy. We cry, worthy is the Lamb. Yet there will be a time in Revelation where the men of the world will be hiding themselves in the caves and the rocks and for fear. And they will say, hide us from him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Father, to those who are yours, you are life, you are peace, you are joy. But to those who are not, you are the God who judges. I mean, you are to us too, but you've already judged our sin through your son Jesus Christ. So that we are so grateful. For those who do not know your son, those who do not, they will one day stand before you. They will be judged. And Father, we're so grateful that you've allowed us to know you, that you've allowed us to draw near to you so we can be excited for your presence. Not having you, Lord, as, as a trophy, but that we are your trophy, that we are your special people. And, Father, we're so excited to be that. We're so excited to be yours. And we ask, Lord, that as we continue our study through this book of First Samuel, that you would instruct us, you would knit our hearts to this truth of who you are and who we are in you. Simply tonight, Lord, give us ears to hear what your spirit would speak to us, your church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, saints, if you would, please open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. We're going to be dealing with chapters 5 and 6 here this evening. And for those of you that were here last week, we've, we had that point where the Philistines had gone against Israel, and as they had gone against Israel, eventually that, that first time that was there, the 4,000 people of Israel died, and so the leaders of Israel, not the political, um, or not, not the, the, the priestly leaders, but the social leaders said, bring the ark, bring the ark here, and so Hophni and Phinehas, they, they, they brought the ark, and, and so what we, we saw was this, is that they brought the ark and they thought, here's our victory. And the Philistines said, wow, this is it. We're in trouble. We're doomed because God has come into their camp. And yet someone in the Philistines said, guys, fight like men. We, we're gonna, we're, if we're going to die, die like men, fight like men. Conduct yourselves like men. Let's fight. And there was a very great slaughter. And through that, in chapter 4, verse 10, it is said that 30,000 foot soldiers had died in that battle. And then in verse 11, it said the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas both died. And then eventually, Eli would hear the news, and he would die. And then his daughter-in-law would give birth prematurely to a son called Ichabod, which simply says the glory has departed from Israel, and she would die. At this point, we see these two sides of this coin, Israel being defeated, the Philistines being victorious, the ark of God that they thought would destroy the Philistines is now in the Philistines' territory. And this is where Chapter 5 begins, the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod, and when the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, and they set it by Dagon. And we see that what they do is they bring the Ark of the Covenant, and they set it before Dagon, and they consider this a prize. And in all honesty, it is, but it's a booby prize. It's not what they thought it was going to be. There's two passages for you note takers. Jot it down. Um, and I want you to be aware of just how it flows dealing with this context of what we're looking at. 
in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 14. I want to read that one verse to you because when we see the ark of God is now outside of its proper place, it's outside of the tabernacle that was there in Shiloh. Although it was outside and it's here with the Philistines, we're going to see that they are going to experience devastation. However, I do want you to see that according to 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 14, the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. So although the ark wasn't there in the tabernacle, wasn't there the way it should be, because Obed-Edom, and this is a temporary place where the ark is there in his house, Keep in mind that just because the ark was not in the tabernacle doesn't mean that God couldn't bless. And of course, he blesses Obed-Edom. However, we recognize he's not going to bless the Philistines. They capture the ark and they believe that they now are saying, this is a gift to you, Dagon, because you as our God helped us conquer the Israelites and their God. We then captured this Ark of the Covenant, which is where that God resides. And so we're going to put that God into your temple as your trophy. Well, keep in mind that although God can bless where his Ark is, there's another passage to be aware of. This one in the New Testament found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to read two verses to you, verses 14 and 15 just so that you can understand really what's happening here in the context of this passage. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 and 15, it declares this, Now thanks be to God who always leads us into triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. And then it says this in verse 15, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Verse 16 says this, to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. We are all of us, the aroma of Christ. Some of those that we run into are going to say, wow, in you I recognize there's life. I want to be a part of that life. To others, they say, no, I want no part of that life. You to me, is you're going to call me to die to the life that I want. I don't want that death. I want to just continue to live the life and I'll take whatever consequences come. So recognize that this ark, to Israel would be the fragrance of life. To the Philistines, however, we're going to see in just a moment, it is the fragrance of death. Now, as they have this ark, as they've now taken this ark, eventually in chapter 6, verse 2, the Philistines are going to call for the priests and the diviners saying, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Please tell us how we should send it to its place. In other words, we didn't get rid of this ark we can't keep this ark here any longer. So when we see what happens, the Philistines take the ark of God, they bring it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Now, just make a note of that. Ashdod is one of the five major cities of the Philistines. The Philistines overall have five major cities. For those of you that are note takers, the first is Ashdod. The second would be Gath, which is about maybe 10, 12 miles away, a little bit to the south, a little bit to the east. And then the third city would be Ekron. Amazingly, Gath is mentioned there in verse 8. Ekron is mentioned in verse 10. Two cities that aren't mentioned at this point are Gaza and Ashkelon. There are five major cities that are there with the Philistines. Eventually, in chapter 6, verse 17, we will get there tonight. It makes this statement. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, 
one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron. So we begin to see here the five cities that are there of the major cities of the Philistines. Well, at this point, they take it to numero uno. They take it to, in a sense, uh, an impromptu capital, but it's Ashdod. And as they're there in Ashdod, it makes a statement, verse 2, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Here's your trophy. This is now yours. Now keep in mind that in the earlier chapter, they were concerned because they thought what? The God of Israel would destroy them on the battlefield. Keep in mind, God gave them victory over on Israel on the battlefield, but he hasn't given them victory over him. Take a look at what happens. In verse 3, the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, and there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and they set it in its place again. I want you to notice the pronoun that's there. It's not him, it's not her, it's it. They recognize the Spirit is trying to let us know that Dagon is an it. And so what happens is they put the ark into the temple of Dagon, set it by Dagon, and when they come in the morning, there is Dagon bowing down, if you will, prostrating himself before the God of Israel. A couple of passages that I just want to share with you. If you're a note taker, you can jot them down. If not, just list it. I want to share them with you. The first is found in Psalm 115. In Psalm 115, I want to read to you the first 11 verses. It deals exactly with this situation, but it makes this statement. Psalm 115, verse 1, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us but to your name give glory. In other words, you glorify yourself. Give yourself glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? Now, think about this for just a second. Now that the Philistines had conquered Israel and brought their God and set it before temple, the, their Dagon's temple, do you think they're wondering, where is this God? Where is this power? Note what happens. Verse 3 makes this declaration. But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Now, we are going to read in the next two chapters exactly this truth. God, he's in heaven. He's controlling everything here. And he is going to do exactly what he pleases. That his name would be glorified that all would understand that he is the God of all gods and that Dagon is nothing compared to him and that God himself can destroy all of the Philistines if God himself chooses. Now we see this in verse 4 of Psalm 115. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. Ears they have, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He goes on to, he, your God, is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Do you understand? You don't trust in horses and chariots. You don't trust in in what man can do. You only trust in God and God's plan and what God chooses to do. And this is key. The last passage that I want to share with you is found in the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 10, let me read this to you. A couple of verses just to kind of show you exactly what's going on. In Jeremiah chapter 10, beginning in verse 2, I'm going to read down into verse 6 just because I love that verse. But in in Jeremiah 10 verse 2, it says this, Thus says the Lord, 
Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heavens, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest and work the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. Now, this is the key. I want you to grasp this for just a second. What they do is they they cut this idol and then they try to keep it as level as it can so it doesn't tip. And the last thing that here Jeremiah says, which is really important, is after they decorate it with silver and gold. They now have to make their God as beautiful as they can afford. Now, not as beautiful as he is, but only as beautiful as they can afford. Some, well, you're going to have a copper God. Some, you're going to have a silver God. But if you got enough money, you're going to have a gold God. Like it's going to help you any more than a copper God. But notice what he says. Then they fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. Oh, had the Philistines wished that they had read Jeremiah's prophecy, that they would say, oh, let's attach him just in case he falls down. Well, he says, they are upright like a palm tree. They cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great and your name is great in might or in power. I love the fact that here we see that they believe that their God, Dagon, has conquered the God of Israel, the God of all gods. And so what happens in verse 3, when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and they set it in its place again. Now, I don't know about you, but Dagon really needed first alert. He needed one of those little buttons that said, hey, I've fallen and I can't get up. Help me out here. Yet it was amazing. Now think about this. And and whether you think this is a coincidence, oh, what a coincidence that they just so happened to put the ark there before Dagon and Dagon happens to tip and fall down on his face before the ark. Amazingly, guess what happens? It's the Philistines that have to pick up their God. It's the Philistines that have to stand him upright again. Do you understand that if you have to pick up a God and to make it stand upright, this God is probably not going to save you. It probably doesn't have a lot of power. But they don't recognize that. They take Dagon and they set it in its place again. Now in verse 4, when they rose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both the palms of the hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left on it. Now we see the next morning they get up. They've already set Dagon up the first time. And now they come in the second time, and again, he's fallen on his face. This time, he falls so hard, he slammed to the ground so hard that his head is broken off and his hands are broken off. And all that's left is the torso. So you could call him Dagon the Stump. You could call him Stumpy at this point because that's all that's left of him. And so at this point, we see here that is it one of those things where is this a coincidence? Well, maybe the first one would be a coincidence, but not the second. And now what happens is this, because Dagon is broken, verse 5 says, Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashtod to this day. Now, as Dagon is lying in pieces, they don't pick him up. They leave him in pieces, but no one goes into that area 
to where Dagon once stood. Now they just leave him alone in his misery. Oh, Stumpy is by himself now at this point because now they don't go in through the threshold. No one is there. And so no one comes into Dagon's house and walks on the floor where he fell over. Now, if that's not enough, if they think, well, maybe this is just two coincidences in a row, now, verse 6 says, but the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. Now, the tumor simply in the Hebrew means mounds. It means it's this bubbling that's happened. There are multiple different views as people look to Scripture. And so because it's not clear, we know that it is bubbling on the body. Some people believe that it is a, a, a type of the um, plague that comes through the rats, and the reason they believe that is because as the people of the Philistines send the ark back, it, it makes a statement that not only do they send these golden tumors that's there, but they also send these golden rats along with it. And so when they do see these tumors and they see the rats, that all of a sudden... Some scholars believe that what God does is he sent rats, and then through that, there came the plague. There's others who believe that the rats were separate, and the plague itself was all by itself, but they have tumors. Some people believe the tumors were simply hemorrhoids. Um, some people believe that the tumors were down, there, you know, down in the groin area. There's a hint that that may be the case Keep in mind that there was one commentator, and I kind of liked his attitude. It might be true, it might not, but I liked what he had to say. He made this statement that it was sort of like God was spanking them. <laughs> sort of like you want pain on your backside, that's what a spanking would do. And that's kind of what these tumors that they had did. And so we see in verse 6, the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod. He ravaged them and he struck them with tumor, tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. So not just Ashdod, but those around Ashdod, that of one of the major cities of the Philistines, God began to deal with them. They began to suffer greatly. It then goes on where they recognize this is just a coincidence. Something has happened. We have all these cities here in, in Phil, Philistia, and, and we, we recognize that only Ashdod here is being hit by this plague. Could it be because the ark of God is here and the God of Israel is not happy with us? Well, verse 7 says this, When the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh towards us, and Dagon our God. So apparently, after Dagon falls to pieces, they begin to get these the, the plagues, and they begin to get these tumors, and they recognize the coincidence it probably, maybe, the God of Israel is not happy with us. So verse 8, Therefore they sent and they gathered, the, to, to, gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of God of Israel away. So now they're moving it. From one place to another place. They're moving it where initially it was there in Ashdod. Now they're moving it to Gath, about 12 miles away to the south and to the east. And so that's where it is now. Now that that ark is there, a couple of things that I want you to just have in your mind as we continue to go on. But it makes this statement in Romans chapter 14. 
I want to read just a couple of verses to you just so you can kind of grasp a, a truth that's here. But it makes a statement where they here in Ashdod think we don't want to have God among us. Let's move God on. I'm just going to bypass God. I'm going to get rid of him. There's no longer an Ashdod. We'll send him to Gath. But it makes this statement in Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. He says this, Oh, why do you judge your brother? Oh, why do you show contempt for your brother? And then he says this, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You can't push him on. You can't say, I don't want nothing, God. Let's just move them on there. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. And this is such a powerful truth that we need to understand. You can't move God on. You've got to make a choice. You can't say, well, I'll deal with Jesus later. No, you need to make a choice. There is no, under, there's no name under heaven given to men by which men must be saved. You make a choice to Jesus Christ. You either accept him or you reject him. If you're neutral, you are not accepting him. God sees that as rejection. You have only one choice. You accept Jesus Christ. All other is rejection. And I love the fact that here they like, we can't handle this. Let's just move him on. And God says, there's no way that you are going to move me on. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to read just a couple of verses to you. I want to read verses 15 and 16. It simply declares this. Once again, we are to God the fragrance of Christ, to those who are being saved among those who are perishing. To one we are the aroma of death leading to death, the other the aroma of life leading to life. We recognize that there with God in us, there is this truth that to right now, Ashdod sees this. This is death. This is death. Gath is about to figure it out. Now in verse 9, back in our text of 1 Samuel chapter 5, it says, So it was, after they had carried it away, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction, and he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And so it was, the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, they have brought the ark of the God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. They recognize that this is doom. What a coincidence. They put it in Dagon's temple, he falls down. They put Dagon up, now he falls down in pieces. And then eventually these people, Plague breaks out. The tumors break out in Ashdod. They move it to, to, Gaza, uh, to Gath. All of a sudden, the plague now happens in Gath. From Gath, they move it to Ekron. And now it begins to happen in Ekron. Do you think that's a coincidence? Or do you really think, wow, maybe there's more to this than simply a coincidence? I do want to share something for you Bible students. As we made mention, there are five cities in that are major cities there in the Philistines. The two that aren't mentioned are Gaza and Ashkelon, but I do want you to see that although they're not judged now, don't think that they won't be judged eventually. Let me just share you this passage, Jeremiah chapter 47, verse 5. It says this, Baldness has come upon Gaza and Ashkelon is cut off. With the remnant of their valley, how long will you cut yourself? So he's going to deal with the other two cities. Not, not at this point. So just keep in mind that although God doesn't deal with you right now, he's going to deal with you. And there's a lot of people that say, I don't want to come to Christ. My life is good and I'm doing fine. Eventually you will stand before Christ and you will be judged. And, and so it's important to get right now. You can't simply just push him on and push him on as the, 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 the people of the Philistines are doing. Now, their understanding of Ekron is, oh my goodness, 
You have brought this ark to us to kill us and our people. Why are you doing this to us? So, verse 11, they sent and they gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city and the hand of God was very heavy there. So we begin to see there's all kinds of destruction that's happening. So with these tumors and with the rats that are going on, God is bringing destruction to the cities of the Philistines. Now, verse 12, the men who did not die were stricken, were stricken with the tumors and the city and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So there were those who were dying, those that had tumors, they were miserable. So either you're going to be miserable, you're going to die. In any ways, the destruction of God upon that city was incredible. And as their, their cry is going up to heaven, guess what? Dagon's not up to hear it. God is, but God's like, no, this is your prize. This is what you get. This is when you're, you're not yet repenting. You're not yet turning to me. You're still thinking Dagon is something. If you know that I am the God that is above all gods, leave your God. Leave Stumpy. Come to me. And, and understand that. They could do that. But what? That would be a really tough thing for their priests. It would be a tough thing for the people to say, we have been wrong our entire lives. But isn't that what every new believer recognizes? I've been God. I've been wrong my entire life. I thought God was this, or I thought Jesus was this. And now that I hear in the word that I'm a sinner, and the wages of sin is death, that I should be separated from God, but now God can bring me back. God can restore me. God can be the one to draw me back to him. So, verse 1 of chapter 6 makes this declaration. Now, the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. So, seven months. So, I don't know how many weeks goes by before Ashdod brings it to Gath. I don't know how many weeks go by before Gath brings it to Ekron. But seven months have gone by. That's a lot of tumors. That's a lot of death. That's a lot of destruction. That They keep the ark of God in their vicinity so God can continue to punish them. Well, in verse 2, the Philistines called for the priest and the diviner saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us now. Tell us how we should send it to its place. And they're saying, listen, we got to get rid of this ark. We cannot keep it. We can't go from city to city to city. This ark is killing us. The God of that ark is disciplining us. We have to send it back to Israel. Israel is a lousy fighter, but oh my goodness, their God is good. And he can fight, and he is victorious, and there's nothing we can do against him. So tell us, how should we send it to its place? Verse 3. So they said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. In other words, we have intentionally done wrong. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand was not removed from you. Then they said, what is the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, five golden tumors, and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for the same plague was on all of you and on all your lords. So keep in mind that where verse 17 and 18, these are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering for the Lord one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron, and the golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords. So we see here that both the tumors and the rats. So they would give a bubbled gold, and then they would give a gold that looked like a rat. And so they would give him these gifts. 
Now, I want you to understand that what these priests of Dagon and the diviners are thinking is it's still probably just a coincidence. And so they are going to try to manipulate the circumstances to try to make it almost impossible for the ark to be returned to Israel. And so thus, when they set all these golden tumors and golden rats, that they're thinking, oh, we'll get the gold back. And so what's happening is this. Verse 5 says, therefore, you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods, and from your land. So, all right, give him this offering. Give him what he desires. And then through that, we begin to see this. He makes a statement now. Verse 6, why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he did mighty things among them? They did not let the people go that they might depart. Now, therefore, make a new cart. Take two milk cows, which have never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord, set it on a cart, and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by its side, and then send it away and let it go. And watch, if it goes up the road to its own territory to Beth Shemesh, then he has done this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. So I want you to understand that these priests and diviners are still thinking no, no, this is all a coincidence. Event after event after event, although the logical mind says it has to be God, their leaders say it might not be. Now, can you imagine this? Dagon falls night one. He falls night two. Falls to pieces. You can't enter anymore. You have the attack on Ashdod both with the rats and the tumors, then it moves to Gath. As soon as the ark moves to Gath, then it moves to Ekron. As soon as the ark moves to Ekron. And Ekron and everyone, it's the ark, it's the ark. But these religious leaders say, maybe it's not. How often are there infallible proofs of Jesus Christ that he is God as he claimed to be? As others claimed he was, that in the beginning was the word, the word became flesh, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we understand, we behold this glory, we know who he is, and we understand that this man, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came and died on the cross for our sins as a substitute, that yes, he lived, yes, he died, yes, he went to the grave, and yes, he resurrected. And there were witnesses. This is the gospel that Jesus lived. He died on the cross for our sins. He raised again, proof that our sins were forgiven, and there were witnesses. This is what our life as Christians should witness, that yes, I've died with Christ, but I've now been raised to this new life with him, this life of the spirit. And I want others to witness this new life that I live. This life that I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what we do. Well, all of a sudden, I want you to recognize that still in verse 9 of chapter 6, they think... Know that it's not his hand that struck us. It happened by chance. It just might be. Now, what they've done is this. I want you to understand how complicated they made this. That one, they took new mama cows. And this is what they did. They said, verse 7, take a new cart, 
take two milk cows which have never been yoked. Now, keep in mind that if you haven't trained an animal with a yoke, if you haven't trained an animal to pull a cart, what's going to happen is this. They're going to panic because of that yoke. They're going to pull the cart crazily because of that yoke because it's never been on them before. And not only that, you have two cows. So if one wants to behave, the other one says, oh, I'm not going to do that. And they're going to literally think the one cow, as they're unequally yoked, one is pushing forward, one is pulling back, they're being pinched. The one cow is going to think, you're hurting me, I want to get away from you. That's why you have to have them trained on a yoke. And you train that. Well, all of a sudden, these are brand new cows. They've never been yoked. And so you would think they're either going to stand there, do nothing. They're going to wander around or they're going to kick at this cart. They're going to try to do something. And on top of that, they say at the end of verse 7, take their calves home away from them. They have new babies. What mother in nature doesn't want her babies. Well, they're human people, yeah, but, but in nature, they want their babies. And so much so that what we see in verse 12, then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh, and they went along the highway, lowing as they went. Keep in mind that God had orchestrated these cows getting together, these cows learning to be yoked, these cows walking in the right direction, and these cows are complaining, I want my baby. They're crying for their babies. They're lowing, they're mooing. And so if you've ever been a farm person, like I was a farm boy, you recognize mamas want their babies. And so they'll moo for them. They'll, they'll try to get their babies. That's what these wanted. They, they're, they're doing exactly what God needed them to do, exactly what these priests and diviners think it's going to be. The odds of this happening are going to be astronomical. Well, guess what? God doesn't deal with odds. He's not worried about odds. And so when you think about here, what the world says is, what are the odds of this or what are the odds of that? And there's some point where eventually the odds become what? Where they're just ludicrous. It cannot absolutely happen. It's an impossibility. And to understand, let me just share with you one thing. That when you have one times ten with ten zeros behind it, it's considered statistically an impossibility, it could never happen. One times 10 with 10 zeros behind it. I don't know what that number is, but they, whatever they call that number, it's considered a statistical impossibility. I did some research just to try to figure out what are the odds of a DNA structure being formed by chance. And it was one times 10 with 400 zeros behind it. Do you understand that? One time with 400, that's, that's beyond ludicrous, beyond, and then they say, hey, we just happened by chance. It, it's beyond statistically an impossibility a thousand times. A thousand times. And, and you can't do that, but yet Mankind thinks we're so wise, it can happen by chance. And that's what was happening here. These guys were trying to set up a scenario that would be so impossible that it could never really happen. Brand new mamas that would walk away from their babies wouldn't happen. New cows that have never been yoked, like they're going to be comfortable in a yoke. All these things are statistically to say what? It's not going to happen. And if it didn't happen, guess what? They're like... Well, we've already made your gold into these tumors and into the rats, and you can't really have them back. We'll take it because we'll give the day gone. We'll keep them for, for our priestly ministries. And they had a hook, but guess what? They didn't know God. And they didn't know God, and they didn't believe God, but know this, these cows did. These cows knew God, and they obeyed God. And so we see here that, that when they thought, if it doesn't happen, maybe it's by chance. Well, verse 10 of chapter 6, 
And 1 Samuel says this, Then the men did so. They took the two milk cows, hitched them to the cart, shut up their calves at home, and they set the ark of the Lord on the cart. And the rest and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh. They didn't even wander around. A cow doesn't know where to go. They're not fighting against each other. They're walking simply. They're going to Beth Shemesh. And, and as they were going along the highway, lowing as they went, and they did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Now, the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted their eyes, and they saw the ark, and they rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there, and a large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart. They offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord, and the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. Now I want you to understand that what's happening is in their rush, the children of Israel are making many, many mistakes. The first thing is they think is, okay, here's an ark, here's new wood, let's make an offering. Let's split the wood and let's offer these cows. There's a passage in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3, which makes a statement about offerings. It says, if his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Everything that was offered was the males. The offering is the male, not the female. The female, God says, hey, you need the female to bring more and more offspring. Don't offer the female. You offer the males. Offer them in their strength. Give me the male. And here they say, hey, we got some cows. Let's offer them. And so they simply in their rush take what they have and apply that to say, God, this is what came to me. This is what we're going to give to you, recognizing what? you got to still use your mind. Just because something comes to you doesn't necessarily mean that this is how God wants. He wants you to discern what is right and what is wrong. And many times the enemy is going to say what? Oh, give God, give this, give God this. God says, I don't want that. I don't want that. Now, notice what happens. Verse 16 says this. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron, the five major cities of the Philistines. And the golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as even as far as the large stone of Abel, which they set the ark of the Lord, which the stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. So they have recognized that they now put this, these golden tumors upon that rock. They now go ahead and they burn the offering. And then what was happening was this. We do not know why. Scripture doesn't say it, 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 we recognize that they know they've opened up the little chest. They, they saw the golden tubers. They saw the rats. They understand what that was. They put that aside. Now, I don't know why they would look into the ark, but they did. There's some people say, well, they're checking to see if the, the tablets of the law were still there. That's a possibility. But understand, verse 19 says, Then he, that is God, struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. And he struck 50,000 and 70 men of the people. And the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. At this point, a couple of things to be aware of. There is a passage in the book of Numbers, chapter 4. I want to read to you just a couple of verses. I want to read to you verse 5, and then I want to read to you verse 19 through 20. 
But in verse 5 of Numbers chapter 4, it makes a declaration. It says this, When the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his sons shall come, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Do you understand? No one in Israel was supposed to see the Ark of the Covenant. Their ministry was simply to see it was covered. And the Levites should have known, you got to cover the Ark, you got to cover the Ark. But they didn't. They said, let's look into the Ark. In Numbers 4, verses 19 and 20 says, But do this in regard to them, that they might live and not die when they approach the most holy things. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint each of them to his service and his task, but they shall not go in to watch while the holy things are being covered, lest they die. God says you shouldn't even be looking upon the ark, let alone looking in the ark. As we see this, it's one of those things where now comes this understanding, what did they do? Well, all we know is this, they looked into the ark. It says here that he struck 50,070 men of the people, and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. This verse here, you're going to find in different Bibles, in different translations, like the NIV will say there's 70 men. Not, 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 not 50,000 and 70, it's just 70 men. This verse in the Hebrew text is a mess. I'm just going to be honest with you, it's a mess. The way that it's worded is this. It actually makes a statement that there are literally 70 men, 50,000 men, and, and then it goes on to say lamented, people because the Lord had smitten a great slaughter. That's it, just in its incense. In, in, in it's just clearest sense. Now it says 70 men, 50,000 men. And, and then it talks about directly afterwards, lamented and the people because of the Lord, because he had smitten with a great slaughter. Normally what happened is this. In the Hebrew, you would have the greater number first, 50,000, and then you would say 50,000 men and 70 men. That's how they would write it. But this is different. It says 70 men, and it doesn't say and 50,000. It, it just doesn't. It says 70 men, 50,000 men. And so to us, very naturally, it's 50,000 and 70 men. There are others who actually believe that there were 70 men and 50,000 were lamenting with the people because of the great slaughter. Remember back in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 10, it made a statement, so the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. Every man fled to his tent and there was a very great slaughter and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. 30,000 is a very great slaughter. And so the question being is, were there 50,000 and 70 men? Were there 70 men or were there something in between? What was the number? And the answer is, scholars really are still arguing this day about that. I look to this and say that, wow, God struck the people with a great slaughter. It doesn't say that this all happened in one day. If there were people, people, people coming and seeing, then eventually God says, that's it, we're done. And you've looked into the ark. So keep in mind, there isn't a timeline to when this happened. So can 50,000 people in 70 look into an ark? I don't know why they couldn't. I mean, I, I know that there's, you know, what, like 70-some thousand people, they're up in Green Bay and Lambeau Field, all look at this little ball that's sitting there on a 50-yard line. They can do that. Whether they do it all at once, whether they do it through a line, I don't know. I personally have no problem with there being 50,070 men. I don't. 
If you think the number is too high and you want to make it to 70 and think that 70 is a great slaughter, then you can still... The issue being is what? They looked into the ark when they shouldn't have. I believe the numbers for what they are. I I think the the, the writing of it, I agree that it's a mess. I, I wish it was clearer, but it's not. And because it's not, good men of God hold to different views. And and I'm okay with that. I will not disfellowship because someone holds to a different view on me when the text is not clear like all of us would hope that it would be. So at this point, let's just keep this in mind. Verse 19, he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark. And the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. That much we know. The number, suspect, but that part we know. Verse 20 says this, And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God, and to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kirjath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. So guess what they're doing? <laughs> they're kind of doing what the Ash daughters did. <laughs> Let's move it on. We didn't do it right. God's dealing with us. And then rather than repenting, rather than doing it right, guess what they do? They just move it on. And you know what's going to happen? Here that germ is going to be blessed. They're going to be fine. And I think it's so important to recognize that when it comes to Jesus Christ and what he did for us, that we begin to see here, when that ark comes... And, and, and through that loss, all of Israel is going to lament, but then Samuel is going to come on the scene, and he's going to draw the people back to the Lord, and there's going to be repentance. And then from that repentance is going to be blessings. And it's so important to recognize here, you can push it off, you can push it off, you can push it off, or you can do what? Or you can deal with it. When God and his word tries to deal with something in your heart, you have one of two choices. You can either allow his word to help correct you and grow you and mature you into love, into grace, into truth for for you and what God has for you. And, And I think it's so important that this is what the word of God, or you can just put it off and say, no, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to just push it off. Understand, as a Christian, you can push it off, but God's going to do what? He's going to bring it right back around. He says, here, deal with it again. Deal with it again. And then if you push it off, God's going to say, all right, and he's going to bring it right back around. And that's God because he loves us so much. He doesn't want to allow us to be in a place that is not growing. And so I, I just I love the fact that here we see over and over again there's opportunities to repent, and repentance is not on the list. It's always let's, let's just pass the buck, let's move it on. I want to continue in the state in which I am, and keep in mind that all of them were what? Miserable. Miserable. How often have you ever been, as a Christian, in sin, God's asking you to repent, and you're miserable? David makes this statement. He says, my bones dried up like a potsherd. I was all dried up on the inside. There was no soundness in my flesh until I repented. And then he says this so beautifully in Psalm 51. He said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Not restore unto me salvation, but the joy of it. And as he confessed again, when he repented, he turned, he confessed, joy again comes. So you can either fight with God and continue to be miserable or just agree with God. God, you're right. If you said it, it's right. If your word declares it, I need to believe it and I need to walk it. And I need your word to correct me, to draw me back to you, back to your heart, back to grace. And as you do this, then I want to become a part of what? This fragrance of life. The fragrance of life. 
to others, they can't receive it. It's just going to be the fragrance of death. They can't receive that truth. But to us, to us, it's life. And may we be these people who say, you know what? All right, bring the ark. God, bring your presence. And we want to simply adore you. We want to see you glorified. We want to exalt you. Allow your presence to be in our midst. There's some things I do believe that God wants us to simply do without having to look inside and say, I want to know all the details. There's been many things that God has told me, say, I want you to do this, I want you, what about that, what about this? The details aren't important for you. I just need you to obey me and to go there. There's some things we can look into and some things God says it's not for you to look into. It's just for you to do. Trust me on this. I can't give you the answers on all these things. And so often when it comes to the questions, people ask, why did God do this? And why did God? We don't know why God did it. But you know what? Even though you don't know the answer to something, fall back on what you do know. You know that God is good. You know that his plan is perfect. You know that he loves you. So recognize that what's ever happening has to be in that context that God loves me and it's his plan and it's a good plan. I don't know how yet. I don't know why yet, but I do trust that it is. Even when it comes to a death of someone that I love or pain of someone that I love or hospitalization of someone that I love. I don't know. God, why did you take this person? Why did you take this little girl? Why did you, why aren't they here? I don't know those answers, but I can fall back and why I know. God, I know you're good though. I know you're good. And if you chose to take this little girl, it was, it was necessary it was part of your plan, and I know that the plan is right. I don't know how it's right, but I know you, and I know you're good, and I can trust that. Some things we are called not to look into, but simply do what he's called us to do. Find in his word what he calls us to walk. And, and whether it makes sense or not, or whether it's a little extra work or not, you still have to do it. Don't take the cows because they're there. Move the cows on and get the oxen. That's what you do. Don't, don't, don't simply look at the ark. You cover the ark. You get the priest to say, listen, we're all back in a way. Someone needs to come and cover the ark. You get the people who are right to do the right things, and you follow those things rather than just what? Well, this is what we have, and I think I can just step in and take authority. on this. Not if God doesn't give it to you. It's so important to be in that place. And, and respect God and, and what he chooses and what he says is the proper and right ways to do things in my own life. I need to ask God, let me walk in that place of holiness and obedience and in trust in you. May we all come to that place. Amen. Well, Father, we're so grateful for just this passage. What an amazing thing that there are people who think time after time that things are just coincidences, but we know, Lord, it's your hand. It's your hand. And we trust that you guide all things, that you sit in the heavens and you do exactly what pleases you. We look into the world and we see the trouble that's there in Israel, but yet, God, you've chosen this time and this situation to bring those things upon Israel. We look to our own nation, we look to our own city, and we see problems within it, and yet, God, you are not off the throne. You've allowed these things for your purpose. We may not know these purpose, but we know that you're good, and there's a plan. And, Father, may we be those who... Even though things may not seem right on the outside, but we can show people with our testimony that we are right on the inside. Because of you, we have peace. Because of you, we have joy. Because of you, we have life. So do the work within us. Knit our hearts to you. We ask in Jesus' name and all the saints of God said, Amen. Amen.